A lot of stuff happens that the news won't tell you. All of it began the first time some of you who know better and are old enough to know better let young people think that they had the right to choose the laws they would obey as long as they were doing it in the name of social protest. Yeah. We had a leak. A serious national security situation. We are now in the process of defeating the radical left, the Marxists, the anarchists, the agitators, the looters, and people who, in many instances, have absolutely no clue what they are doing. The Anarchist Leak, and this is the Leakly News. Hello. Congratulations, you found me, and this time I have a human body. Um, this is going to be a new YouTube series, so let's crack into it. This one is about the housing crisis, specifically in Ireland. Now, if you're a young person in Europe, North America, China, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, chances are you can't afford a house unless daddy is a CEO, and then congratulations to you, and remember, the pitchforks are coming. And while Ireland is no different in having a housing crisis, and in some metrics are actually faring better than other places, in others are much worse though, but um, I've been watching YouTube videos, podcasts, and reading articles about housing crises, and very few others outside Ireland mention our one. So let's delve into it. When it started, who were the major contributors, why it has been going on for so long, and what it means for our society. Dublin is now very expensive to live in. It is €300 Euro more expensive than Paris, uh, €1,165 more expensive than Berlin, €815 more expensive than Amsterdam, and Prague it is €2,295 Euro more expensive to live in. And these are, you know, cities with, like, amenities. So what's going on? With studies finding that Irish people now spend more on their rent than any other country on the world, with 41% of their average wage going on rent than the recommended is 30%. And with one in five Irish people renting because they can't afford a mortgage, and they won't afford a mortgage because the rent is so high, why has this happened? Housing has always been a sticky issue in Ireland. When we were colonised, we had a system of absentee landlords who would own vast amounts of land, which they would never visit or perhaps go once a year. On these vast estates the labourers would live, they would either be working on the grounds of the estate, but keep sufficiently far away so the landlord doesn't have to look at them. Or they would live even further on land the landlord owned, but isn't part of the estate. This first group would basically make the estate look nice, and the second group would do what they do to survive. Both were poor and both would pay rent. This system was unfair to the point where even the British government considered these um, absentee landlords leeches on the Irish people. And if the British government are siding with the Irish people, you know the person is doing wrong. But it was uh, somewhat workable. It was somewhat workable until the famine, that is, when the main source of food for both of these groups disappeared. So they had to spend what little money they had for rent on food, and this meant mass eviction skyrocketed. The police then enacted a system of burning roofs off houses when the tenants couldn't pay rent, so they couldn't even squat in the house, or if they did squat, they would quickly freeze, starve, or get sick and die. This left a deep scar on the Irish psyche to the point where Michael Collins is quoted as and he wants an Ireland where no landlord exists, after seeing an old woman evicted from her home when he was a child. Now, while this current housing crisis has nothing to do with colonialism, instead it's near 100% government policy following the 2008 financial collapse, things like evictions and foreign landlords have a long sordid history on this island. There are a few characters involved in the Irish housing crisis, if by characters you mean faceless corporations with political puppets hellbent on sucking profit for themselves at the expense of ordinary people, and the events which created these characters are still somewhat seen to this day but um they were worse a few years ago and the first one is ghost estates now if these didn't happen the housing crisis wouldn't have happened or wouldn't have happened the way it did so let's look at why they happened a ghost estate is legally defined as a place with more than 10 houses built to less than 50% completion. Now this has a lot of overlap, so if 9 houses are built to 40% completion that wouldn't count, and if 50 houses are built to 60% completion that wouldn't count either. But even still, as of 2010, over 600 ghost estates with more than 300,000 houses existed in Ireland. Me and my schoolmates even used to play around them as children, and if you're running around playing hurling in a sitting room of an unfinished abandoned house twice the size of your own, I, I have to tell you it feels pretty strange we even knew that as children a way to put the vast extent of these houses into perspective is that for every 15 people in ireland there was one half finished house which was left abandoned so uh think about that next time you see a one bed studio apartment for 800 a month so these 300,000 plus houses were meant to be completed, but what happened what happened was the 2008 financial crash and how the irish government dealt with that See, the crash hit Ireland hard, and the government decided that strict austerity and massive bank bailouts is 
what's needed. What this resulted in was developers losing money being forced to lay off builders who now sit at home on social welfare waiting to work while half finished houses that they were building started to rot. But at least the bankers who caused it all got bonuses so it wasn't a total loss. And in Ireland an unhabitable unoccupied building isn't subject to tax whereas a nearly finished one with no residence is. So if a home was nearly finished when the crash happened there were cases according to the Irish Times where developers would purposefully uh, destroy the houses so they wouldn't have to pay tax on them. Currently the number of ghost estates in Ireland is around a 400 number with 15 to 20,000 unfinished houses. So the biggest estates around the country have been completed but the smaller more numerous ones around the country aren't or haven't been. But something needed to be done about the debt that people in the country had and this is where NAMA comes in. NAMA isn't just what a ghost says, it's a government agency with one of the worst business practices the world has ever seen. NAMA means National Asset Management Agency and here's how it works. If you have a debt that's a massive mortgage or mortgages you can't pay back, um, NAMA buys it off you. This takes the debt away from the banks and at least on paper makes the country look richer. They then manage these assets whether they be debt or more than likely a house or land and try to get the money back off them for the state. They do this in generally two ways. Number one, they sell to a developer. This can be an Irish developer or a foreign investment hedge or vulture fund, they're all the same. They buy up houses, property or land bought for extravagant prices for pennies on the dollar. People have made billions from this, so someone before the crash buys a business for half a million, let's say. The collapse happens, NAMA assumes the debt, takes the premises and then sells it for a quarter of a million. This halves the debt in the country, makes it look a bit better to, uh, that new businesses are open. But what usually happens is this. The person or faceless consortium, which is what it usually is, who bought the property for a quarter of a million, waits till the price inflate again and sells it for the original half a million. They take all the profits while the state is still stuck with the debt. I used to have a landlord who this very thing happened to. He lived during the Celtic Tiger and bought house after house and ended up with double figures in properties and a huge debt near 10 million. The crash then happened and NAMA took most of his houses but did a deal with him and the bank to take interest rates off his debt and allowed him to keep some of the less extravagant houses he had which is where I was staying and trust me it was not extravagant when I moved in there was a dead rat on the doorstep. But he said that NAMA was the best thing that ever happened to him because he got to keep the same houses after he knowingly got too greedy and he didn't have to deal with the debt that much anymore. There is a very good reason for this too. I have a friend who's a debt collector for a bank and don't worry about me and him think it's weird that a debt collector and a socialist are friends. But he said that they are told to go harder on people who are a few hundred or thousand in debt and if they take longer making back those payments it's actually better for the bank because they make interest from it. But if someone is 10 million in debt, you actually treat them better because you know they'll never be able to pay that back. And if you apply unnecessary pressure to them, they could kill themselves and then the bank has to take the debt. So keeping them alive for as long as possible is the best solution because they'll pay back what little they can. This also proves that the best way to rob a bank is to take out a massive loan and just not repay it. The second solution NAMA has is they can hold the land and either start renting it or if work needs to be done on a higher government or private companies to do that. This is a better option but wasn't done as much because it doesn't work quickly enough. So option one is taking the debt and even though you're losing on it, it's ending it quickly. Option two, you might get more money from it but it'll be over a longer period of time. But still to this day, NAMA does have quite a lot of property. NAMA took on and managed 31.8 billion of failing debts and while their business practices leave something to be desired, they are not compared to the next group category, whatever you want to call them. Cunts. One of the most common developers NAMA sell to is distressed debt funds. These are also called hedge funds, cuckoo funds or vulture funds. One of the largest and most controversial of these funds is called Cerberus. And just an aside here, if you start a business and decide to name it after the demon dog who guards hell, that's not going to be a business that inspires hope in capitalism. Cerberus bought up 1 billion worth of loans but paid only 800 million back to AIB alone. They paid less than 10,000 in tax over the two years between 2014 and 2013 which is when they were making the most amount of money. So banks are prepared to make a huge loss on their unperforming loans by selling them to groups who will barely pay any tax while they keep the profits for themselves and pass the financial losses onto you the taxpayer all to balance the books. 
24 billion euro worth of loans, including tens of thousands of family mortgages, were sold at less than half of their true value to vulture funds at this time. Cerberus operates in nine countries, 11 if you count the offshore tax havens, buying up debt and have made a profit of 45 billion in 2019, and operate their main tax office out of, among other things, a barber shop in Aruba, a kebab shop in the Cayman Islands. The tax avoidance here is astonishing. Stephen Donnelly, now a Fianna Fáil Darlin, but a few years ago, while he was still in the Social Democrats, stated this. I believe that these vulture funds are about to pull off the largest tax avoidance on Irish profits in the history of the state. The scale is likely to be within the tens of billions in missed taxes. Stephen Donnelly now works for a party who brought these vulture funds into the country. And here's where we get to the really shitty part, because that was just the intro. If, let's say, you just had one house or one mortgage but couldn't pay it back for whatever reason, banks could sell that debt, including the mortgage and the house, to groups like Cerberus without the homeowner's knowledge. So one day you owe money to a bank, the next a vulture fund, who work under a very different set of laws and practices, with profit being the only and main goal. So if they see it as more profitable to kick you out and to get in new residence while increasing the rent, even if that means paying off your mortgage so that they can do that, they will do that. They can then hire private security to evict you and this is why since 2014 when these companies started to fully implement themselves into Irish society the homeless figures in Ireland have jumped 232% with one third of those being children. So these distressed death funds they can then sell on the house they obtain for pennies off the state, increase the price of the houses across the country or city, inflate the rents and the more property they own the easier it is for them to do this. David Hall, CEO of Mortgage Holders Ireland, who I interviewed for an article last year, stated the government rolled out the red carpet to the vultures, throwing the consumers completely under the bus. When asked what good did the vulture funds provide for society, his response was tell him. Fuck all. So this housing crisis has been going on now for about 14 years and whether it's from stopping construction, creating institutions with short term money losing goals or inviting in groups whose interest is keeping rents high, our housing crisis is 100% a creation of Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael and there's no other way of looking at it no matter how much they posture about it. And it is evident in the fact that 36% of Fianna Gael TDs are landlords and 33% of Fianna Fáil are landlords with unknown figures of the money these parties have invested in groups like Cerberus or how many of their family members are landlords so it doesn't look like they are. These two parties have no interest in stopping the housing crisis and it could easily be done. They could open up regulation on renovating empty areas above shops which currently is a bureaucratic nightmare. They could make NAMA develop more houses or build social housing. They could loosen height laws in Dublin and allowing more high rises in the city using them like Vienna's luxury social housing. They could support the building of tiny home estates in the countryside. They could enshrine the right to a house in the constitution and stop looking at housing as an investment and rather as a necessity to live. But the reality is they have no interest in doing any of this because they profit off the system and it won't change while they are there. Housing crises also do push people towards populism with France, UK and USA for example all experiencing housing crises and an increase in populism with things such as Le Pen, Brexit and Trump. The housing crisis is affecting everyone in the country now. Young people have to live at home, unable to buy or barely able to rent. People going into extreme unending debt because of something they need to survive. People choosing to have less children as when rents rose 10% in London, births fell by 5%. Housing crises also increase crime, suicide, poverty and destitution. All these make people eager to remove the government that has created it. But with what is the question? Because when Sinn Féin are elected, which more than likely they will be, and if they don't fix it, even though they didn't cause it, what happens after is completely unknown, and an unknown in politics is a very dangerous thing. Or on the right side, it could mean the League Party comes to power and rules with an iron fist and achieves utopia almost immediately. <laughs> well, that's a very brief overview of the housing crisis in Ireland. I could go more into it if you want. Um comment like subscribe share uh, do all those good things uh, there will be a patreon as well in the description if you want to follow if you want to support it would be very much appreciated and i'll see you next time notes from a society that's about to crumble into dust 
As the rich rob the poor from their ivory tower, people worry about their future while their present turns to rust. Trained soldiers murder civilians as they cower, those who talk about truth so mistrust. As the future looks dour, it's now up to us. Get feet on the street as we near our final hour, their irrational decisions will destroy the planet. To those who view life as worth less than the markets, to all systems of greed and power, you are now legitimate targets. Thank you.